from the Digital Media Center on the campus of Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. This is Ramping Up Your English, an educational program for intermediate level English language learners. Here's your host for Ramping Up Your English, John Letts. Welcome to Ramping Up Your English. Ramping Up Your English is an instructional support program for intermediate level English learners. Now, if you've already passed the beginning stages of learning English and you want to reach higher levels of English proficiency, this program is designed to meet your needs and get you closer to your goal. Ramping Up Your English is for English learners from all language backgrounds and for people of all ages. We take a content-based approach to helping you reach higher levels of English proficiency. Our current thematic unit is Native Americans. This is segment one of episode 93. The year 1491 was probably like any other year in the Americas. Across the ocean in Europe, however, events were unfolding that would eventually have an effect on every single Native American or their descendants. In part six of the Native American video series produced for Ramping Up Your English, we took a look at the way some Native American groups lived before the influence of Europeans. The brief presence of Vikings was fleeting, their effects localized. In this episode, we begin by sharing part one of number seven in the Native American series. Now this video again looks at how some groups of Native Americans lived prior to contact with Europeans. Let's see what we can learn using your current level of English comprehension skills. So many good things come from the waters. In the year 1491, the coastlines of North and South America were home to many people, as well as the vast land in between. On the Gulf Coast in Mesoamerica, the ancient Olmec left huge figures from centuries earlier. By 1491, the mother culture, as they're known, had passed, evolved into the Maya, most researchers think. This was only one coast to nurture new cultures. With their abundance of life, the coastal areas sustained societies that stratified into various classes of citizens. In some areas, people grouped themselves into clans, extended family groups that honored certain animals. In Mesoamerica, the Maya spread inland and built a society that endured for centuries. By 1491, the classic Maya culture had declined with many great cities abandoned by the people, leaving great stone structures in their wake. The city we call Palenque was built in the late Classic period. While the spirit of earlier culture remained, the rulers of Palenque put their own mark on this later society, made possible by the collapse of Tikal. The Maya were once believed to be peaceful astronomers, but Palenque shows another side of this culture. Here in this courtyard, we see the trophies, pieces of monuments to rulers of rival Mayan cities, overthrown by Palenque's warriors. Palenque supplied enough samples of Mayan writing to help researchers crack the code, deciphering the Mayan writing. Mayan history is well recorded at Palenque. 
including the crowning of the great leader Pakal by his father. Palenque fell, as did other Mayan cities. Too many trees were cleared for farmland, aggravating severe drought. All the prayers to Chakmol, the rain god, and all the human sacrifices to it did not stop the ecological collapse. New cities emerged and warrior societies became strong, but much of the Mayan glory was reclaimed by the forest, like this once towering pyramid at Tikal. In central Mexico, the new power was the Aztec Empire, building their capital city of Tinochtitlan. By 1491, the Aztec Empire exercised power over most of Mesoamerica. In western South America, the expansive Inca Empire sprawled along the Pacific Ocean. In 1491, power was concentrated in the hands of Tupac Inca, and the future looked promising for this well-organized society. Further north along the Pacific coast, the ocean's bounty allowed Native Americans in the northwest to thrive. The land bridge from Asia had long since flooded by 1491. That crossing was so long ago that it passed from collective memory. Along the coast in southeast Alaska, tribes like the Tlingit, the Haida, and the Simshian had established wealthy, stratified societies. With so much life teeming all around them, People on the northwest coast found their needs met by this generous ocean, freeing them to create elaborate totem poles and to put on potlatch events that went on for days. For those with skills and courage, it was a good life. Further south along the Pacific coast, tribes were numerous and distinct from each other. Many of these tiny territories had stratified societies just like their neighbors up north. The languages were also distinct, one group's tongue unintelligible to its neighbors. While not as large in population, nor as wealthy as the people further north, the coastal Indians in the Pacific Northwest enjoyed natural riches and animal life. From Alaska to California, good things came from the ocean. Life was different for Native Americans living inland. In the Columbia River Basin, the lifeblood was salmon. Salmon swim upriver in their spawning migration. Then they die to bring nutrients back to the forest. The salmon, the river, and the mountain we call Mount Hood, all are sacred to the people of the plateau. Celilo Falls was part of the river where massive amounts of salmon were harvested, yet it was much more than that, according to Pat McMillan, curator of the Fable Museum in Klamath Falls. And so that was an area where they, you know, fished easily, basically, because they could uh, catch the fish right off the rocks. And um, so they were, that was just an amazing sort of thing. Another thing I thought was interesting about all of them is that if you were ill and you were sick or incapacitated in some way, you were always taken care of. That they always caught fish for all of the people in the tribe. And um, it didn't really matter to them. In, in fact, along that area we just mentioned, the Long Narrows, it said that a fisherman could catch a ton of fish a day. Wow. <laughs> the Columbia River provided inspiration as well as sustenance in 1491, a gathering place for related tribes. Some even made their homes right on the banks in places of natural shelter. Also along the banks of the Columbia River, Indians built fishing platforms. They belonged to certain families and they were handed down over generations. Pat McMillan explains. 
If your grandmother or grandfather had a spot, it was passed down to you or your family, however. Mm -hmm. But they also were very generous. I've, I've read that also, where they would be like um, a, a loan if someone came into the area without <laughs> tribal affiliation. Uh, they would loan those. It would be like a cabin, I suppose, in the summertime if you had it and loaned it to your friends. But they, they, were, not, they were not selfish people. The Klamath Indians attended these gatherings and would have passed the sacred mountain we call Mount Jefferson on their journey home. The Klamaths had their own sacred mountain in their territory. This is what Mount Mazama looked like in 1491. The Klamath people still have the mountain's great eruption in their collective memory. The eruption was a result of an epic battle between gods, Mazama being the most changed from that conflict. Oh, and there was a beautiful maiden and romance involved. The victor in that great battle was Mount Shasta, even in 1491, Mount Shasta still had some eruptions in its future. In a world where everything was alive in spirit, the bear was an important figure in the mythology of people who lived within view of this great mountain. Storyteller Tom Doty explains. Bear is very important. We often refer to him as great bear in the sky, and bear in our mythology is in control of the seasons. Uh, we see bear as the Big Dipper constellation, also means, you know, Ursa Major, Big Bear, right? Yeah. And, and that constellation circles counterclockwise to the night around the North Star. Well, that's bear dancing around the fire in his lodge. And as he's dancing around that fire, he is sending the seasons circling through the year. So that when we do our dances down here on the earth, our circle dances, we always dance counterclockwise here locally to honor the great bear in the sky and to help keep the seasons moving through the year. And, and you're mentioning about there always being animal people you know, in the stories. There's a reason for that. The animals in the stories not only have certain characteristics of the animals themselves, so we all, you know, coyote is, 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 is the obvious one, you know, yeah. and so and bear has kind of this slow moving, kind of lumbering kind of way of moving in the stories, even though he's kind of slow speaking, he's very smart and he can move very fast when he wants to. All of the characteristics, the animal characteristics, are in the characters and the myths, but there's also human characteristics in each of these animals. And that's how we're, we can relate to them as human beings, in that they are also out there doing stuff that people do, that human people do as well. Yeah. Now, uh, one of the things in, in our region, uh, not long ago, uh, a new casino opened up in Wairika, and mm. it's called the Rain Rock. <laughs> I had no idea what a Rain Rock was, right. but actually that is very important, uh, the Rain Rock. The Rain Rocks are, and, and they're also connected to the bear mythology. The Rain Rocks are, are rocks scattered around the region, both Southern Oregon, Northern California. They often have cupules or these, these, these holes that are, that are, that are in them. And the bear clan of each of the local tribes or villages were basically in charge of the rain rocks. And the rain rocks were used to control weather. So you would, you would cover up the rock to, to stop the rain. You would uncover it to bring rain. There was also things about wind. They're very, fairly complicated sorts of things. But almost all of the, the rain rocks have bear paws carved on them because the, the weather and the seasonal changes are so closely associated with great bear in the sky. And then you also have this rock uh, just called the bear rock mm -hmm. that's uh, apparently uh, close to or on one of the table rocks? Yeah, yeah, lower table rock. It's, uh, it's near the summit of, uh, at one point as you go up the, the BLM trail up, up lower table rock, there's a, there's a point toward the top that it's joined by the old time Indian trail and they're actually the same trail. And so as you come up to the summit of the rock, um, you see this, this bare rock in the middle of the trail. And, uh, and so in a, as the seasons would change through the year, we would climb 
up that rock, up Lower Table Rock, and we would pass the bear rock, and we'd, we'd pat bear on mm -hmm. his nose lightly, not to wake him up, you know, if it was that time of year, and thank him for the seasons, and then a ceremony would be done on top, a bear dance, always circling counterclockwise. And so the bear rock is a physical representation there on Lower Table Rock in the center of our universe. Mount Shasta was named for the people who lived in this area. The Shasta Indians also had some presence in southern Oregon. Mount Shasta also had importance to other tribes, including the Pitt River Indians. The English name for these people came from the style of house they constructed. People in the arid southwest built houses of similar design. Then some built houses into cliffs. This is what they would have looked like in 1491, as the Anasazi had already abandoned dwellings like Mesa Verde. Unrelenting drought drove them to set up new communities along the Rio Grande River, a dependable, though narrow, source of water. Thus evolved the Pueblo culture, noted for its high development of pottery making. The Pueblo people endure to this day though some of the river settlements were abandoned, like those at Frijoles Canyon. In 1491, we also saw the Diné people established in the southwest. We know them as the Navajo. These speakers of the Athapascan language family are believed to have arrived in America in a third and much later wave of migration from Asia. As with the related Apache, the Diné had been established far to the north in the subarctic region. For reasons unknown, they undertook an epic migration southward, finally settling in the arid canyon country of the American Southwest. According to their own stories, the Navajo interacted with the Pueblo people, adopting many of the Pueblo ways, but rejecting living in cities. The family Hogan was their societal center. When the Navajo settled this land, they gave up their hunting ways from their long trek across the Great Plains. They became farmers. Above all else, the Navajo seek balance. Walking the path of beauty and peace is highly valued. The killing of an enemy upset the balance and ceremonies had to be performed to restore health and balance. They were the blessed way. The great journey of the Navajo took them across the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains. There they encountered other Indian tribes. These encounters were often violent. Some, like the Comanches and the Utes, remain enemies of the Navajo and Apache to this day. In 1491, the Great Plains region was characterized by ever-moving tribes because of its great size. A vital food source was bison, also nomadic, moving in great herds. All parts of the bison were used to sustain people in this region. Besides the food, the skin became material for blankets and the cured hide for teepees the shelter that supported this nomadic lifestyle. People in the southeast were more sedentary. By 1491, the great earthen mound cities were mostly abandoned, indicating a decline in the farming-based Mississippian culture. The Cadoan culture continued, as seen in the city of Spiro, Safely west of most Mississippian cities, the Cadoan cities missed the frequent warfare that ravaged Mississippian cities in the east. We'll learn more about that region in part two. You're watching Ramping Up Your English. This is segment two of episode 93. The video you just watched was the first part of a longer video about Native Americans on the cusp of major changes. Now we'll share the second part in a future episode, and that part will contain the credits for Native Americans Part 7. Since the video we just shared is about pre-Columbian American history, 
It's a good time to practice the verb tenses that allow us to relate actions, events, and situations in relation to other events, actions, and situations in the past. Now, in this case, we'll concentrate on the situations and habitual actions that were present before contact with Europeans that started in the year 1492. Let's look at some ongoing practices of Native American groups from that time. Native Americans developed hundreds of different languages. Native Americans in the Pacific Northwest developed highly organized societies built around wealth. And people in the Columbia River Plateau gathered salmon and hosted great gatherings. Klamath Indians traveled north to Celilo Falls to trade with other tribes. Native Americans near Mount Shasta told stories of the bear people and used rain rocks to influence the weather. People in southern Oregon conducted ritual dance circles that always moved counterclockwise. The Pitt River Indians built pit houses with entrance through the smoke hole. The Navajo in the southwest lived in hogans, a form of pit house that had a side entrance. Native Americans of the Great Plains used buffalo hides to make teepees for shelter during their foraging travels. And some Native Americans still lived in Mississippian culture cities and grew corn. Now, the other event in history is the coming of Europeans in the wake of Spanish exploration. And since that also happened in the past, we'll practice today with the past perfect verb tenses. We always use the past tense of have as the helping verb, so we always use had with the main verb. We pair the word had with the past participle of the main verb. For simplicity, I'm not going to write down the part about the coming of the Spanish explorers with every sentence. Just assume that somewhere is a prepositional phrase that communicates the past events we're related to other uh, in the main idea. Examples are before the discovery of America by Europeans, prior to European arrival, by the time Europeans arrived, during pre-Columbian history, or simply before Columbus. Now, by the time Europeans arrived, Native Americans had developed hundreds of different languages. Prior to European arrival, Native Americans in the Pacific Northwest had developed highly organized societies built on wealth. People of the Columbia Plateau had gathered salmon and had hosted great gatherings. Klamath Indians had traveled to Celilo Falls to trade with other tribes. Native Americans near Mount Shasta had told stories of the bear people and had used rain rocks to influence the weather. People in southern Oregon had conducted ritual dance circles that always moved counterclockwise. The Pitt River Indians had built pit houses with the entrance through the smoke hole. The Navajo in the southwest had lived in hogans, a form of pit house that had a side entrance. Native Americans of the Great Plains had used buffalo hides to make teepees for shelter during their foraging travels. And some Native Americans had lived in Mississippian culture cities and had grown corn. Now thinking back on the video we saw earlier, the approach of the 500th anniversary of Columbus's voyage, that anniversary in 1992, inspired National Geographic magazine to devote an entire issue to the way Native Americans lived prior to that European contact. A sample of Native American groups explores the kinds of lives people lived in various parts of America. Now, much of the information I used about the Navajo in today's featured video is from a National Geographic book entitled Trail of Tears, Paths of Beauty. The title reflects the forced removal of Native Americans from their homelands. The widest known is the removal of the Cherokee from their homelands in the east to territory west of the Mississippi. Now, this event is known as the Trail of Tears, part of this book's travels excuse me, title. 
Now, as we'll learn later in this unit, the Cherokee were not the only people forced to move. There was not one trail of tears, there were many. And that includes the removal of the Navajo. This book looks at both of these groups and features some of the practices and attitudes, the approaches to life, their worldview of the Navajo and Cherokee. And it's from that source that I conveyed some knowledge about the Navajo. It's from the second part of the title, Paths of Beauty, that I learned about the richness of the lives of the Navajo people as they lived in the year 1491 and before. Concepts like the importance of balance, the purification needed after battle, and other aspects of Navajo's blessed ways were learned from sections of this book. Yet I used only a fraction of what this book relates about the worldview and spirituality of the Navajo people. There's a great deal more to learn about how these people see the world and value balance including their special connection to the land in which they live. So I highly recommend you get access to this book. Have your local library show you. They should have a copy, and if they don't, they should get one. You may also find a copy at a used bookstore or online. Now, if you do have to pay, to a pay full price, it would still be a great investment in knowledge. It's entitled Trails of Tears, Paths of Beauty by National Geographic Books. I'll have the ISBN on my website to help you in your search. I love to hear from viewers. You can contact me at letscreatepro at gmail.com. Visit my website, letscreate.org, where you will find there the support materials for this episode. Just choose the Native American unit from the homepage. Then click on episode 94. Ramping Up Your English can be seen on RVTV, on channel 15, on the Ashland Home Network, and on channel 182 in the rest of Southern Oregon on Charter Cable. You can stream Ramping Up Your English for free from rvtv.sou.edu. All episodes can be found on archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. You can watch and even download all the episodes there. Enter Ramping Up Your English in the search box. I want to thank my director, Wanda Borland, and my talented and dedicated crew, and I want to thank you, our viewers. All of you help make this program an award winner. Join me next time for Ramping Up Your English. I'm John Letts. You've been watching Ramping Up Your English, a support program for intermediate level English language learners. Learn more. Visit our website at letscreate.org. You can also watch or download today's program at archive.org slash details slash TV. Join us next time on RVTV Voices for Ramping Up Your English.